Today we have Richard Lamy, who's talking about Brythonic uh, mythology. So that be this is going to be so fun. Right, let me just get him in. Do you notice I've got a little bit of music now? It's quite cool, right? <laughs> okay, let's admit him. Here we go. <laughs> And there he is. And hello, Richard. How are you? Hello, hello. How are you? <laughs> good, good, good. Right. So, Brythonic mythology. I said it correctly, yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, give us a. So, what is Brythonic mythology? It's uh, put my British teeth in. mythology. Brythonic okay. means British, and uh, it's our original mythology from Britain. Okay, so uh, you were saying it was Welsh, so it's Britain and part is, so is that, would you say it's predominantly Welsh then, or? Well, it's British, and um, the language that was spoken in Britain was something close, well, not too far from Welsh. Okay, and it's, uh, so is it? had incursions in by the Romans, you know, who... who I'm who having trouble connecting to the internet. Country. Take a look at the help the section in your Alexa app. And then we had, you know, um, incursions from Germans. Um, we had some tempted ones from Vikings. And then we had the French invasion with William the Conqueror, who was um, uh, probably sort of Scandinavian slash French originally. Oh, wow. Brilliant. OK. Um, yeah, so... Is it Celtic? <laughs> no, it said people would say, yes, it's Celtic, but Celtic's a convenient myth created by the English. Um, oh, really? In the 18th and the 19th centuries to explain how all these people were pushed out to the boundary, you know, the borders of Britain, um, and they were Celts. The Celts got up to, 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 to France, to Gaul, um, and they got to Iberia. So you'll find a lot of information on Celtism in, in Gaul and in Iberia. Um, and clearly they would have been um, there would have been intercourse between them trading and and you know mi minor migrations and, and and mixing of the peoples, you know, as would have been normal. Um, and, but um, it's it's this Celtic thing's a whole myth. People were British, but you know, when you had a German king who didn't speak English, and within 10 years of him being put on the throne, um, there was an insurrection against him. Uh, the establishment decided to close ranks and say, oh, all these other people, they're Celts, they're not British. But actually, they're British, originally British. <laughs> Interesting. I do like the word Celtic, though. It sounds good. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So talk a bit about so the Goedelic versus Brythonic. Well, Goedelic is, there are two strains of what they call the Celtic languages. Goedelic, which is Irish and Scottish and Brythonic, which is British, which is which is Welsh. And they've diverged, you know, over the, over the many years. Um, so there are some words of the same, you know, if I and um, if I see some Gaelic, I can understand a word here or there. Um, but uh, they're not the same, but they have a similar root. OK, so there. So, yeah, I wouldn't understand any Gaelic whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the stories about and why is it such, such a fascination for you? Well, I woke up one morning, I say conveniently, <laughs> and having studied a lot of mythology you know, over a long, long time, I wondered, and I'd been looking at um, various you know, collective um, consciousness of people around the world, and so, you know, you're, you're sort of, you have your personal subconscious family, tribal, ethnic, you know, and so on. And um, I noticed that all the mythology that I'd been studying was Middle Eastern. It was Abrahamic, you know, which, and I've got a map out and I said, this one's from the Middle East. Um, and I don't have any tribal or ethnic um, connection with the Middle East. At least I didn't think I did, um, but, I thought, well, I do have, you know, I, I'm of British origin somehow or other, so I thought. Yeah. Um, and so I said, well, why do I want to study cultures, mythology that I don't not particularly identify with Middle Eastern culture? Um, there must be something Britain, and I found there was. And then I entered the gentle, the door of the gentle rabbit hole 
<laughs> of the map in Ogion. Ooh. Um, now, it's awesome. uh, a, a number of stories that managed to survive uh, destruction over the many, many years. Some of them go back to Bronze Age um, mythology, and some are, are, are later. A lot of it was captured in about the 12th century. It had a Christian gloss put on it to get it through the Christian censors. Um, and I was completely taken by these stories, which are just like unbelievable stories. Uh, and so I then decided I was going to learn Welsh. <laughs> so because a lot of the names, there's clues in the names and, and it, you know, it helps. So I've been doing a Welsh lesson every day for nearly two years. Wow. And I wouldn't call myself fluent by any meth by any means but i do i can understand you know names like gwalchmai is the hawk of may which is uh -huh. very interesting in druidic uh, lore um and so on so i got dragged down the rabbit hole and then as you'll see you know there are many translations of uh, uh, versions of the mabinogian um all by different people some of them have got some one. This one's got wonderful art by Margaret Jones in it, um, which is just, you know, mind blowing. Oh, um, wow. And so there are many translations uh, with slight variations. And it's really the notes to the to the stories that you want okay. to you, you dig into, because of, like, particularly in Shauna Davis's one, the, the notes tell you the family, the person, you know, they go right deep into into. Um, where these people were and, and where they came from uh, and then i put this off but i couldn't avoid it i i, I entered into the the uh the, the king arthur's mentioned in in the mabinogi and i entered into that rabbit hole which i'm still in um and trying to make sense out of it. Mm, okay cool so you've got mm. Yeah, well, steeped in mystery and magic and astrological law. So tell me a bit more about the uh, about the astro astrological aspect. Right, there are various books. Okay. All the astrology, not all, of it, uh, have, they've decoded the stories in the Mabinogion um, into astrological law. There are many layers beneath the stories that at first seem like sort of fairy stories. Um, I've done a lot of work digging into these things. Um, my take on it is that no one author has got has got everything, as with most things. No yeah. one author has got everything. But if you read enough around it and apply your own critical thinking, you can join a lot of dots. So I've found out that three of the characters in the Mabinogi stories um, represented the pole star, <clears throat> which moves, you know, based on the wobble of the planet. Ooh. So Bran, Math, and Arthur um, each represent present a different pole star as the, uh, because we see north you know the pole star being sort of true north that that's based on where the planet is and its little wobble because it wobbles around it um, wow yeah precession cool um, so you know there's there's loads and loads i mean it's, it's stuff that's buried in so deeply into this and of course it's only it's only been around for been available to the public for 150 years oh. because it was all written in middle welsh and some things were, you know, the, the books, a lot, a lot have obviously been destroyed. Some are now in the, in the Harleian libraries and Bodley and, and, and you know, you can get access to, access to them. And uh, Lady Charlotte Guest got a team of scholars to translate them for the first time in about 18, 1850 or something like that. Wow. So it's all very new. Um, and then when you dig in, you know, more, you suddenly find that there's a massive amount of British history that is written down. And it's totally ignored by the establishment. Hmm. It, well, that doesn't surprise me <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> so, so you said that the the stories um, they they include King Arthur. And that's really interesting because I always thought that was like just a myth. You know, it's all you know the myth, but there's no substance behind that. So, have you got any more clues on on that? Yeah, I mean, it's like myth. There's, there's some truth in it, and there's some folklore around it. Um, and I avoided it like the plague because I know it would have been very convoluted, but I couldn't avoid it forever. So I ended up um, somehow or other um, on one of the Welsh Facebook pages. I came across these guys, Wilson and Blackick. Oh. And that suddenly opened up a huge rabbit hole. 
um, just mind-blowingly big. And that's when I start to understand that the history that we've been taught it has been just glossed over and conveniently packaged up. Um, so what these guys have done, they've actually gone back to, to the Welsh records and they've uh, translated them if they needed to, and they've written them all down and they've catalogued them and they've cross-referenced them. So in one of their books, they've gone through the, the charters of the kings. This is, and these are from, they've gone back to, to Cardiff, to Llandaff Cathedral. And in Llandaff Cathedral, they've got, um, everything's listed in terms of, um, Things that people did, you know, they kept um, they kept detailed detailed records on um, things like land that was granted to them, um, but then they had about seven witnesses for each grant. They were very very careful, and the reason people granted land to them was was, was either because they felt they wanted to sort of get closer to God, you know, the sort of pressure, or um, um, Arthur's father Meirig um, had been pulled in with one of his rivals by the church and told to stop fighting each other. Um, but he ended up getting his rival killed. So the church excommunicated him. So he sort of oh. didn't do anything about it. And then as he's getting older, he said, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> um, so he granted land to the church, as many people did. And that's how the church got a lot of land, basically by extortionism. Oh, um, yeah. And he then was not excommunicated so he could get age of Christian burial. Oh, gosh. But the, those, those, those charters in, in, in Cardiff Cathedral, you know, document um, very, very clearly um, all sorts of the people, you know, they, and they, when they talk about someone, they didn't have surnames in Wales. So, you know, they had Arthur at Meirig, Arthur, son of Meirig, uh, and son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. They didn't have surnames. Oh. So they, really, they tracked, they, they, and, they, it, they, and they all knew their genealogy, you know, very, very tightly. They could recite it going back a thousand years or more. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you see so-and-so, you know, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, then you've got uh, the beginnings of making up uh, a proper, you know, sort of a family tree or, or you know, organization chart, if you like. Yeah. And then you have um, wedding lists, again, where all the guests were written down, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, so and so. Um, <laughs> lots of other things that were recorded, and they cross-checked them, and they all agree. Oh. So now we know that there were two, there were probably five sort of Arthurs, um, but there were two main ones. One fought the Romans, and, and um, I think he was son of, uh, of Maxim Ledig, who was a, a British Roman emperor. And he basically chased the, <coughs> the Romans all the way down to the south of France where he got killed. Uh, I don't think they ever found the body or mm. they never found him anyway. And then there was mm. Arthur II who fought the Saxons and united uh, the parts of Britain that had not been encroached on by the Germans. Um, and he was the one where all his famous battles are listed. And so, so what these guys have done is they've actually located, um, you know, Baden Hill. Where's Baden Hill? Well, let's look in Wales at the Ordnance Survey maps. Oh, there's Baden Hill. Oh, what's all the fields had names. What's the field next to it? Oh, it's called the Field of Slaughter. Oh. Uh, and so they found so much stuff just by deduction, really, just by using scientific historical methods. They, yeah. they, they, they've uncovered... The history now they've been attacked um they've been assaulted uh, they've really? been physically attacked by really? the establishment um i think someone tried to burn their house one of their houses down um they've been verbally abused because obviously academia doesn't like someone upsetting you know their no. phd thesis no, oh, so they've got they've received massive amounts of victory but they've hung in there um, one of the guys is in his 90s he's still alive the other guy's younger, um, and luckily, what they've done is they said, "Well, you can't, you can't cover it up if we write it down." Wow! So they wrote it down, and they've done some fantastic books. Now, uh, where are these guys from? Um, Alan Wilson's from Liverpool slash North Wales, and Baron Blackett is from Newcastle. Okay. They don't have a particularly like Welsh agenda. 
Mm. Um, but they do have an agenda for um, uncovering the truth. Right. They've done a huge job on that. Now, Adrian Gilbert worked with them and created this book, um, Home nice. Kingdom, because he was a, he's a pretty good author on esoteric type subjects. Mm -hmm. And um, they actually found the stone. They found they found the stone in the church where I think they believe Arthur was buried, um, and they bought the church to stop it being destroyed. Wow! And um, they they won't they they were only allowed to do excavations in like October. You know they they held off and made it as difficult as possible for them to do it. And they found a stone with his name on. Um, awesome. So, you know I'm in awe of these guys, and I haven't. And but by any means read deeply enough on what they're doing. But as you can see, when you read these books, um, you have to you have to annotate them or you yes. have to mark them. Yes. There's so many facts in there. Yeah. But the Wilson and Blackett's books aren't particularly well written in terms of authorship, but they're just packed, jam-packed full of facts. Wow. Brilliant. Well, these guys are awesome. <laughs> yeah, I take my hat off to them. Yes, yes, and yes, I do as well if I had my hat on. <laughs> so how did you how did you find out about all this all this information? Well, once Apart I from... opened the door the rabbit hole by reading the Mabinogian and I actually got an audio book on it because it's easy to listen to somebody that can pronounce the names properly. I got led down that path and then I started digging in. So what does it mean? And I found all the astrological stuff underneath it. Um, and every story has has got, a, a, it's got, um, you know, three or four layers um, in it. There's, you know, the, there's the transformer who became, who was transformed himself, you know, Gwydion. Um, and it was just mind blowing. So I, I then decided that this would be great material for a tarot deck. So oh. I've, um, I've done about 400 pages on reference and PowerPoint. I've now found an artist, a lovely, wonderful artist called Zoe Spencer, and um, she's doing the first card, uh, and it's quite difficult because, you know, we kind of go backwards and forwards with, with the design, uh, but she can pick up artistically where I can't. I'm not an artist, so I, I draw down the little stick men and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> simple little drills all out of scale and, and whatever, but I point the arrows to say, you know, we need a shield here with a pentagram on it, and we need this, that, and the other. Wow, cool! So it's going to be based on, on the stuff that you've been yeah, learning. Be on Brythonic. Oh, that's yeah. wow! And the card, the characters fit the fit the, you know, they're like the, if you take the hermetic meanings uh -huh. of the cards, you know, they they largely fit that pretty well. I mean, some of the a lot of the cards I'm going, I'm redesigning, but I'm keeping the same concept in. You know, as probably like the Paul Foster case concept of them uh -huh. the abrahamic ising them and i'm making it brythonic wow excellent so herod when will be we're by at lake bala you know with the cauldron she won't be the high priestess sitting with the, the waters of consciousness behind her flowing through her legs right okay oh wow this oh well put me down for a set of them <laughs> that's very yeah. exciting <laughs> uh, yeah. year, so there's some um, 22 majors and 16 court cards, and each court card is a person. Oh, really? 38. So, yeah, so you've got a, quite, a bit, quite a bit of work to do there still. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, it's <laughs> a huge project. What sort of areas do the stories of the Mabigoni, Gon, I can't say it still, yeah. <laughs> deal with? <laughs> um, there's, four, there's, there's four branches which kind of flow from um, with 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 Bendigo Fran, the king of, of Britain, um, going to rescue his sister from the Irish, um, and there's a magic cauldron involved in that, um, and then that flows. Uh, before that, there's a story about um, Push and, and get going down and becoming king of the underworld, which is about opposing astrological um, zodiac signs. Um, and then we get into you know areas where the land's enchanted and they have to find a way to 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 get the enchantment taken off the land and and and, um, and then we get into all sorts of transformations and trickery and magic um, 
So they, 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 as I say, on the surface, they look like fairy stories, but when you actually look into it and stand back, it's very, very deep and really fascinating to go through. Wow. Yes. Shape-shifting is what one, I've got a little... Oh, yeah, I mean, all that stuff's in there. And, uh, you know, the, the there are people with otherworldly powers and there are people that don't have them. And, uh, my daughter's very fascinated with shape shifting. <laughs> she she really wants to do some shape shifting. She says. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, Gwydion was a great shape shifter. Well, I mean, um, Caridwen was to start with, when she kind of shape shifted through the four elements, chasing Gwionbach, uh, who became Taliesin uh, after she ate the, core, the, the the seed of the corn, um, and then she became pregnant with him and gave birth to Taliesin who was found in, she couldn't kill him, she wanted to, but she couldn't, and he was a radiant brown boy, put him in a basket, chucked him in the water, and he was fished out of the fish, taken out of the fish weir by, by uh, Elfin, um, and was popped his head out of the basket and started talking, you know, at the age of about you know, two, two a month. Or <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> That's brilliant. So what do you recommend? So you've shown me loads of books. What books do you recommend that, so that uh, people should start with? Starting point. That's the first one. This is The Holy Kingdom by Adrian Gilbert. Yeah. If so that know, should be the first. Mabin Noggy. Um, there's, um, I like the audio version by Matt Addis because he's Welsh and he gets the names right and you don't have to struggle with it. With them. Okay. But then there's also translations, you know, John Bollard, Professor John Bollard, um, where he's got actual photographs, you know, of the places. Oh, and that's This cool. stuff is, I say, it's mythology, but it's, it's but like all mythology, you know, it's based on, there's some factual content underneath it. And a lot of the place names, you can actually go, you can find and visit these place names. They're actually there. You don't have to get on, go out to Jerusalem or anywhere else in around the Middle East. Um, they're right on a doorstep. Brilliant. Awesome. So, um, yes. So if you can, it would be lovely if you could uh, pop the links, if you've got some links to um, to any books or maybe after yeah, for, on the I, YouTube channel, that would be really cool. Shall I put them after you've published this? Yes. Once I've done the YouTube chat thing and then you can just stick them on the comments. That would be really That's cool. But just be aware that, you know, this isn't a five minute no, no. It's uh, probably what, half a lifetime. Once you start, <laughs> because I say it's only it was 170 years ago. I think wasn't it? It was only made yeah. available to people. So it's very new. I don't know what's coming out, but what's fascinating is it, we can actually track back through the mythology to our true history in Britain. Yeah. So do you think that uh, just on the last thought, do you think that? <laughs> being a bit, um, how do I put it? <laughs> do you think we've been lied to all our lives about uh, in our history lessons then? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Totally. There's not even... Sort of packaging up, like the Romans controlled the country. They didn't control the country. They never controlled Wales at all. They had 15,000 troops at Carleon. Um, and, that, and they had a fort up at Chester. Um, but they couldn't uh, because... The, the, the British were a very sophisticated people. There's seven acres of buildings in Wales, which um, the, nobody's been bothered to excavate, which they say, anything they find, they say it's Roman. Um, <laughs> but it's pre-Roman. It's not Roman style at all. Um, and they had a very, very uh, sophisticated um, society. Uh, the people were very highly educated. And don't forget, I think the Druids were supposed to have come from Britain and people come here to get trained mm. um, from other countries. And, you know, they, Arthur would have, they had these hill forts. And so where they could spot anyone coming in over the ocean or on the land. And then it's a bit like, you know, going banging a wasp's nest. Um, and they were like expert horsemen and they were very, very well drilled and trained. And the Romans couldn't defeat them. Uh, in fact, no one really did, even the, you know, up to the Normans. I mean, Saxons couldn't, they Arthur basically repelled the Saxons. Mm -hmm. um, and the Normans, what they all they could do really is build these huge castles as a sign of sort of imperialism, but they still couldn't. They still couldn't break the the, the mindset and the culture of the people. Mm. Um, and the, you know, the English tried to destroy the Welsh language by banning it in schools and 
having kids wear a sign on their neck saying no Welsh and smacking the crap out of their hands. Um, writing instruments were banned in Wales for 200 years. Wow. Uh, there's been a massive campaign to try and destroy British history. And it's not Welsh, it's British. Mm. But it's fortunately, you know, at least there's stuff codified and written down um, in Welsh, which allows us to find that out. Makes you think, you know, you, you don't just take what you learn at school, really, and just get out there and get some books no, out. And I think look, we're all we're all British, really. Um, it's easy to say, oh, I'm Welsh or I'm Irish, I'm this, that and the other, but you're not. I just did my had my DNA done. And I went through my true ancestry. And if you pay them enough money, <laughs> you get to find out what you really are, because they take the um, DNA from um, from from um, human remains being found. Really? Wow. So I've got I got a big shock because I, I was told like through ancestry, you know, I'm like half Welsh and Irish and whatever. Um may be the case, but um I've got Merovingian kings, uh I've got some pretty nasty people, a Vandal chieftain, um I've got a uh Viking that was slaughtered in Wiltshire. Um I've got Richard III, who's one of the nastiest people out there. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> uh, and um, the Alemanni tribe, um, all sorts of, you know, people, a lot of, lot of Viking, you know, Iceland, Sweden, Norway. Yeah. Um, but I do have, once I thought, oh, God, this isn't what I wanted to find. But I do have, I do share DNA with um, one of the big Welsh kings who support, British kings that supported Arthur. Um, Irian Gredig. So, you know, that sort of does at least tick one box, but the rest of it, for most yeah. people, I wouldn't really want to be associated with. Oh, God. Well, at least we're can... all like that, I think, Jackie. Yeah, probably. We're all a mixture. No one well, yeah, we all come from one thing in the end of the day, don't we? <laughs> but we live in Britain, and I think it's, it's wonderful if people can start to figure out what British history is and, you know, go. Through. Yeah, and maybe not look in there and not look at what you did at school. <laughs> well, well it's just crossed over and trade yeah it's a shame it's a shame it's a god awful waste of life and when you're little isn't it you could just be like learning the real stuff got, say if you've got a german king that can't speak english because we kind of ran out of ran out of kings here so they imported george the first couldn't speak english um within 10 years of that they had the jacobite rebellion which if you remember uh, uh, mavers um was very much into that um uh then then they had to make up a sort of germanic oriented story mm. so you know so the saxons became like the good guys because they were german mm. uh, and, and so on um but there's a lot of cover-ups um and it's just nice to be able to see that there is a way to find out what the true history of this country was and the british culture was a very sophisticated culture uh, and a lot of the, the Romans, the only way the Romans could actually get into this country, uh, Caesar was soundly beaten and destroyed twice. He tried to invade twice and they, they took him out um, and they lured him up the River Thames and then drove all the cattle and had a scorched earth policy and left him soldiers basically starving. Um, and, and then they, they said, look, why don't you lock us go the way out, there's the door, out you go. And he tried it again and he was soundly defeated again. And then Claudius came over with 40,000 troops, 100 mm. years later, so this is not like two years later, mm. um, but still couldn't subdue the country. But through marry, having his daughter marry the King of Britain, this is how people used to get around this with, with marriage alliances, um, they managed to reach some sort of balance of power within the country. And a lot of the Roman emperors were British, had British blood in them. Mm. Wow. Oh, that's flipping awesome. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's mind-blowing. Mind like, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? A little can of, yes, yeah, it was a big can of worms. I think you've opened up, like, one about that big. <laughs> well, you know, the Dark Ages, as they call them, were actually the Age of Saints for the British people. Mm. And yeah. Christianity came to, uh, it was in Wales, very, very early on, and it would have been sort of Gnostic Christianity, which was then, I think, became closer to what they called Celtic. Christianity, um, but that was suppressed after the the franchise of the Church of Rome um, 
managed to do some power lights, power lights and take over. Wow. But they had their own bishops and they laughed at some of the things the Roman church was saying. Uh, they thought they were fools, um, but they lost out in the power struggle. So the, the Roman franchise um, beat out the other versions. But Christianity is very, very early introduced to, to Britain very, very early. Mm. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That's really, really interesting. I'm glad you've told us all that stuff because it saves me looking in the wrong places. <laughs> I'll, put link, I'll put a set of links up, but I'm, I'm, it's still a work in progress, Jackie. It's, uh, it's yes. too much to digest to do it in, you know, in, in, in six months, a year. It's going to take quite a long time, but yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing and I'm, uh, I'm really drawn into it and motivated by it. That's really cool. Thank you so much. That was so, that's just yeah. brilliant. I'm really looking forward to seeing these tarot cards as well. <laughs> Patience. It's going to take First in the queue. <laughs> it's going to take a long time to paint them. Yes, yes, obviously, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Richard. It's Thanks, been an Jackie. absolute pleasure to talk to you, as always. And um, yes, and hopefully you can give us some more talks in the future. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, um, as I get down the rabbit holes a bit further, I might have a bit more to, to tell you about. Yes, brilliant. There's a great um, thing on YouTube called Britain's Hidden History, uh, run by Bro Ross Broadstock, and he has some massively interesting shows on that. But Ooh. I'll publish, I'll give that, I'll put that in the links. Oh, yes, please. That'd be brilliant. Thank you. Answers, I'll send the links to you and you can put them in as part yes. of it. Yes. OK. Yep. That'd be lovely. Lovely. Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks, Jackie. Take care. Okay, I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh, wow. Now, wasn't that a pleasure? That was so awesome. Just, oh, that's mind blowing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, getting my head around all that now. That's like, yes, that's a lot to think about. Anyway. Thank you so much for uh, having a listen to uh, today's broadcast. Uh, I am Jackie from the Magic Toolbox UK. And if you would like to subscribe, because there's going to be lots more coming up uh, in the near, very near future, we have some more um, amazing interviews coming up. Uh, and it's never going to stop. I'm going to have everybody on the planet that's all mystical and magical coming to talk to me. So if you want to subscribe, please do just press the little subscribe button and the little bell. And then, you know, exactly when we've got another um, a broadcast for you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll speak to you all soon. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye.